Where are we now, and where are we going? Our lists are slow, and our images flicker. Our keyboards cover our inputs, and our inputs can't format text. We can't use multiple modals, and we can't put toasts on top of modals. We can't use modern CSS. Our shadows barely work. It's hard to do shared element transitions, and I don't know how to use native code. If you've been a React Native developer, facing these issues is almost a rite of passage. But little by little, people stepped up and donated their free time to solve many of React Native's fundamental shortcomings. As you can see, in the past year, React Native's feature set has increased dramatically. And many of these features have come from the community rather than React Native itself. And all this has made me wonder, what would React Native look like in its perfect form if we didn't have to accept any of these issues as the way things are? So let's travel through time to 2030 and explore what the future could look like through every release along the way. My plan is to introduce these and see what the next years will look like. And it might come in 2030 or maybe a little bit sooner. And what better place to start than with native modules? What sets React Native apart is the fact that you can use JavaScript to express truly native UI. And since this is such a big selling point, it's important that we have really simple ways of interacting with native code. Otherwise, you end up with a very minor subset of features, and it becomes a bit of a false promise. In the past year, writing native modules has gotten a lot easier with the introduction of Expo modules. I was able to write my own module with the help of ChatGPT in just a few hours called Burnt. And even though it's very simple, it gave me a lot of insight into what the experience is writing nat native code today with React Native. This is what it looks like to do it today. First, you have separate code in your iOS and Android folders, where you have your Swift and Kotlin files, respectively. Every time you make native changes, you have to rebuild your native app and restart the dev server to get it running. Next, you have to import your native code using this function called require native module. And lastly, if you want to add TypeScript types, you just have to manually cast it on top of them. Now, this is pretty good. If you ever try to write a native module without Expo modules, you know that the list is a lot longer. But in the future, it'll be even easier with the introduction of inline native modules. Notice that I'm importing burnt from a Swift file. And I can call its functions with types right in my JavaScript code. With inline native modules, you can suddenly import Swift and Kotlin files right alongside your React code. You don't need separate folders. It lives right in the same place. And while it doesn't technically use fast refresh, whenever you update a native file, your native app will automatically recompile. And it'll be so fast that it feels like fast refresh. Now, probably my favorite part is the automatic TypeScript types. Using AST parsers for Swift and Kotlin, we can read in what the types are and automatically cast them. And using type, TypeScript declaration merging, we can apply these files with their types. And all this will work without any additional setup. So if you're building a library that just needs one native file, or if you have a ton of native files in your app, all you need to do is write it, import it, and you're good to go. So how do we deal with platform inconsistencies? After all, this is only showing a Swift file and what happens here on Android. Turns out this will be pretty easy. You can import your Swift and Android code separately. And here I'm using platform select, but you could use any of the different platform methods to do this. And what's cool is this won't error on either platform. On iOS, the Kotlin file will be tree shaken out, and the same thing will happen on, on Android for the Swift files. And you know, back and forth, you won't have any errors. So as long as you don't call an iOS method on Android, you won't get any errors. And something I love about this approach is each platform has its own types. And that's OK. We want to share code a lot of the time, but I think we forget that it's actually a good thing for each platform to have its own implementations. And it's then up to the JavaScript side to match up the APIs and provide a single interface. You can finally co-locate your native iOS and Android code in a single place. But native modules wouldn't be complete without taking advantage of everything the platform has to offer. And that's why these will also let you import Swift UI files with any without any additional configuration. Just write your Swift UI components and import them and run them like a normal React component. It can receive state and re-render, and it'll also be able to receive children. Everything that you're used to doing with the React component will work here with our Swift UI views. We need access to native APIs 
without headaches. Now, with all that said, not everything native is better. After all, there's a reason we're using JavaScript to build apps. And one of the greatest benefits of using JavaScript here is over-the-air updates. I've tried doing some native updates soon, uh, recently without React, and really, it's, uh, we have no idea how good we have it. Imagine every single time a bug sparks up, you need to do a native build, get a review, and then if they find something from your previous build they didn't like, then you have to you know, just wait a few weeks, and users could just be in a buggy app for weeks. It's, uh, it's just not something I envy from native developers at all. And that's where OTA comes to the rescue. But that said, OTA still lags behind web deployments. When you deploy a new version of your website, it's immediately accessible to every user without any installs. They don't see a banner. They don't have to wait until the next time they open the app. They're always on the latest version. And there's so much peace of mind from that fact. But React Native's over-the-air updates are similar with a little bit of a complication. You have to make a tough decision. Do you prioritize fast time to interactive? Or do you make sure you're, that your app is always up to date? The common pattern I see is this. You ship an update over the air. When someone opens the app, you fetch that update and have it ready for the next time they open the app. As a result, a lot of people are on a stale version. And so if you have a bug, it's possible that they're still experiencing that until they open it the next time. So why not just go the easy route and block users from entering the app until it's downloaded? Well, this is nice from a developer's perspective. You know, it's, it's really safe. But for the users, it's kind of unfortunate. You have to decide how long are you going to force someone to stare at a splash screen until, you're, until your upgrade has downloaded. But all this will be changed in the future with a new addition to Over There Updates called Under the Radar. With Under the Radar, updates are fetched in a background task. Rather than waiting for people to open the app, the latest JS bundle is ready by the time that they open the app again. Whenever you ship a new update, your app receives a silent notification telling it to start downloading the update in the background. And finally, we'll have up-to-date releases together with fast time to interactive, bringing the best parts of the web experience to native deployments. I spent a long time thinking about how to unleash the best parts of web on native. For the past few years, I've been working on a startup called BeatGig. Our product uses the Solido stack, meaning that our website is powered by Next.js, and our mobile app uses React Native, and our UI code is shared across both. Using this stack is a really nice way to understand the differences between platforms. I've really explored where they diverge here, from the ways we navigate to the subtle differences in how Z-index behaviors across, across iOS, Android, and web. And above all, I've discovered the subtle ways in which React Native still lags behind the web. With React Native, you need to use so many components to build basic layouts. In order to press something, you need a pressable. If you want a gradient, you need a gradient component. If you want a mask, you need a mask component. If you want a scroll, you need a, it just it keeps going. Meanwhile, on web, you need a div. Now, I don't think React Native will ever have a div that matches up with web, nor do I think it should. But I think it should be as powerful as the web, and less, but not as unorganized like a strictly typed div. I really love that phrasing. Take well-known APIs and implement the important parts. Now, even though I'm making predictions for 2030, it's possible that Christmas may come early for the strictly typed div. A few months ago, an RFC called React DOM for Native was posted on the React Native discussions board. It appears that React Native is considering implementing it, and this is an example screenshot of its usage. Rather than a view, you can see that we have a single HTML import with a bunch of DOM elements on it. Now, the div doesn't exactly match the web one, but it's close. Instead of using stylesheet, we have a CSS function. And on native, this probably won't do anything. But on web, it'll facilitate creating optimized CSS styles. You can see that we have an on-click handler without needing a pressable component. And something I want you to notice is the comment above on-click says it has a synchronous event. That'll be relevant in just a second. This RFC opens so many doors. All those components that I displayed earlier can all get rolled up into the style prop. 
we could finally use multiple shadows and use the CSS shadow syntax, which is just so much more intuitive than React Natives. And they'll actually work. If you want a gradient, just get rid of the linear gradient component and use the style prop. <sighs> if you want to track when an element has entered the view, this one is really close to my heart because it's super annoying to do, you don't have to change your whole screen to be a flat list. You can get any arbitrary view, track when it's entered the screen with an intersection observer, just like we can on web. Now, as we compare the experience of building with web and native, I want to highlight a very specific UI pattern, and that is formatting text inputs. Let's look at an example from the BeeKig app and website. In this case, the user is typing in a dollar amount, and I want you to pay close attention to the formatting. So it'll be kind of quick here, but hopefully it'll be easy for you to catch. First, let's look at the website. This one works great. I type, I can see the comma pop in right away. There's no flickering. Very easy. Now, I'm going to show you the iPhone, exa iPhone app example next. Same exact component, same exact code, but there's one small difference in what the user sees. OK, so here I type, and it does format well. Right? I still see the commas. But you'll notice that there's this like, one second flicker where it's not formatted. I'm going I'm to show you a slow motion version here so you can actually see it. OK, so here's the same thing, but in slow mo. Notice that I delete, the comma's still there, and then it goes away. And then I type again, and then the comma comes in. Right? This is slowed down, obviously. It's dramatized a bit. But let's look at the code to see why this happens. On the left, I have an HTML input. Whenever I change the text, I first call event prevent default. What this does is it tells the browser when I'm changing the state to ignore the default behavior, which is to add the text to the input. As a result, the input is only ever using the prop for value, which is always formatted. Now, why don't we just do the same thing on native, right? We still have an onChange handler for native that we could call. And the reason is that prevent default doesn't do anything on native. Communication between JavaScript and the native side is asynchronous, meaning that we don't have a synchronous event prevent default function to call. And if we do, it just doesn't do anything. Now, while this may seem like a minor quirk, I think it's a pretty good litmus test for how mature a UI library really is. Little details like this are the difference between an app feeling truly native or not. React Native claims to be truly native, and it's just supposed to be a better abstraction than a web view. But, but when it comes to complex inputs like this, oftentimes a web view might win. In the future, if the React DOM for native RFC comes to life, we will actually have synchronous events like that on-click handler mentioned. And that would mean that our inputs can finally be formatted as well as a website. Another key advancement I'm excited to look at is modern CSS properties. Here's an example of a gradient border using nothing but a mask. And here we have another one from Sam Selikoff using background clip with Tailwind classes. People these days are finding just about every single way to create gradient borders. Another common pattern I'm seeing with modern CSS styles is making an element glow. For web, all you have to do is duplicate a view, absolute position it, and apply a filter. So in this case, Emil is applying a 40 pixel blur in just one line. Now, it's worth noting here, this is not the same behavior as the blur view that we're used to. The blur view that we have from Expo or from React Native in general is a backdrop filter. right? It blurs between your content and what's behind it. Whereas in this case, we're blurring the layer itself. So here, Paco from Linear predicts that the future of web design will be powered by mask, clip path, filter, and other modern CSS properties. And it's no surprise that if you go on the Linear website, you can see a lot of these CSS properties in action. Now, while none of these are currently available in React Native, I think they're coming. These are all additions that are mentioned in the RFC for Native and then uh, React, for, uh, React DOM for native RFC that I mentioned earlier. Let's get rid of the blur view and move all these things into the style prop. It's critical that we don't limit our ability to build great designs with ease. The final part of unsolved styling in the core of React Native is, of course, animations and transitions. We all love reanimated, but just the fact that we need to use it is a bit weird. When I was building Modi, I obsessed over having the simplest API possible. I wanted one import, one object, and no helper functions unless you wanted them. Adding animations should feel like play without any mental overhead or you know, too much setup. 
This was greatly inspired by my prior experience using CSS transitions. With just a single line and no third-party library, you could animate any kind of transition that was happening on a, on a div. And as, as much as I love using Modi and Reanimated, we just shouldn't need third-party libraries for basic high-performance animations. Instead, we should reach for these when we want something more advanced, the way we do on the web with Framer Motion, which is why I'm excited to share what the API will be for built-in transitions for native. We can see here that opacity is updated based on this visible prop. To make the opacity animate when it changes, all we need to do is add it to the transition property. This is exactly what happens with CSS. And unlike now, all the transitions will run with high performance without blocking the JS thread, or at least that's my hope. The same goes for keyframe animations. Simply take an animation object and pass it to the style prop. Here I'm using from and to, but you could actually use any keys that CSS keyframes would allow. And I'm wondering, as I say all these things, like, could this really all take seven years? Like, is, is this really that much? Because it starts to feel pretty obvious, and I wonder why we don't have these things now. If you want to help bring the React Native 2030 vision to life, I want to encourage you to think, what kind of things here would I be good at building? And where can you contribute? I've noticed that when it comes to open source, the biggest changes often come from a few people passionately hacking away on something over the weekend. If you help build it, maybe we could have everything this year. Before closing, I want to highlight this tweet from May 2020 from Evan. Back then, Evan made a quick example for using Expo together with Next.js. And it kind of flew under the radar at the time. But I remember seeing it when I was walking through the streets of Denver, and I immediately jumped into a coffee shop to try it out. Something right there just clicked for me. If only this stack could work, it could be the best way to build front ends without compromise. And there began my multi-year journey of building Dripsy, Modi, Solido, Burnt, Zigo, and more. I never expected to build any open so source software at all. So start tinkering and share your discoveries publicly, no matter how early, because you never know who you'll inspire to take them on. Thank you.